Hey other Akronites, welcome once again to Around Akron with Blue Green. Now on this episode, we're gonna talk about urban gardening. We're gonna talk about soil. We're gonna talk about music at Musica. We're gonna go over to Glendale Steps and we're gonna talk about water skiing here. That's right, water skiing around Akron. All of this and much more. Now to kick this show off, we're here in downtown Akron to talk to Steve Larson, all about urban gardening and soil management. Let's go see what Steve's all about. First, for me, it's reestablishing that connection and understanding that we are a part of nature and a member of nature and not separate from her. And so from that standpoint of recultivating that connection, I feel like that brings us into a, a deeper understanding of how ecosystems and whole systems function, where everything is interconnected and inter interdependent to everything. And it's so complex that we can't possibly comprehend its entirety, but we can start to understand that that's how things function in nature and nature functions in holes and so that impacts how we act with ourselves and with other people and with it, with nature and so I see gardens as a means of kind of rekindling that understanding. Julie Costello of Miss Julie's Kitchen got these plots maybe seven or so years ago and before this plot, and the, this one was just grass, and at one point there are buildings here. And so there are potential foundations still in the ground. Every year we dig up a lot of cinder blocks and bricks, more so from the other garden that we're not in. But that's been a garden for longer than, than this one has. But a lot of times when, or most of the time when the city tears down a building, they hopefully take all the material out, but sometimes they do leave some in the ground and they also bring in fill dirt. And so that's not rich topsoil, but it's just the mineral subsoil. And so it's pretty much lacking in the life that we need to grow healthy vegetable plants. And so throughout the years, I've done a lot with adding compost and using that in order to try to re-inoculate the life into the soil to help that regeneration process. The idea is that when you focus in on soil health, then the health of the soil translates to the health of the plants. And when you have healthier plants, then they're more resistant to pest pressure. And so there's some um, scientists out there that think that the reason why we have a lot of pest pressure within certain crops is partly because that pest likes to eat that crop, but it's also because it's nature's way of saying, this is an unhealthy plant, take care of this for me so that a new one can come in. And so it's seeing it more so within that context of ecosystem secession. You have the, the first secession is starting with just like bedstone and bare rock. And we're not dealing with a lot of that because that's been a process that happened a, a long time ago. And so what we're usually dealing with is when we have a large disturbance and that creates bare soil. And so from that bare soil, you have certain plant species and microbes that colonize that. And some more weedy species start to come in and then more grassy species and then later more perennial species. And we have kind of prairies and then more bushes and then trees and we have a forest. And so it's kind of this secession that nature goes to in order for the land to become a forest. And a lot of times when I first learned that, I just saw it as plants above the ground and plant species that, that come in and there are different species that do that. But underneath the ground, there's a lot that's changing as well. And so the microbiology that's in the ground is also transforming as a secession process happens. And so we see plants as almost these selfless beings that they exist within a, an ecosystem secession and they're there to cultivate that environment so that it's more conducive for the next life to come. And so it's not so much where they're growing because they're going to always be there, but it's because they're growing in order to prime the soil so that more diversity of life can exist there. And a lot of times when, when we're in earlier ecosystem secessions, that means those plants will no longer be around. And so they have a function of, of bringing that ecosystem to a certain state of health to where they're no longer needed. Kind of like a human being, 
we have, our, we have our microbiome, and when that microbiome's out of whack, then we get really sick. And those microbes are actually, they outnumber our human cells, and so we're more so this community of individuals that make up this one person. And so when one of those are lacking, then we have health problems. And so if we eat food, then we're not gonna be able to extract all the nutrients that our body needs. And we have, and we get sick. And so the same thing, or very similar process happens with plants, where if they're missing that, any aspect of that, that microbiome and nutrients that aren't available to them because that microbiome is missing, then they get sick and they're unhappy and then pest pressure comes in. And so it's a, um, it's a very theoretical process that takes more nuance, time, and experience actually bringing it into, into practice. But for me, it's exciting to, to be a part of that process because it's, again, it's not just growing vegetables, but it's re-understanding how we view life existing and functioning. And so it allows that, re that, that recultivation of that, that experience with the world around us, facilitated by vegetables growing in the city, supplying food for Mr. Lee's Kitchen in our community. Next up, we're down here on Maiden Lane, the historic arts district, also known as Blue Zone. But for today, we're here to check out Musica. Let's go see what this place is all about. This is my block. Like when I talk about my community, like it's this area, the blue zone as my boss <laughs> lovingly refers to it as. So Musica, I think our 12 year anniversary is in October. So it's been here 12 years. Um, this alley, it's weird to say I have a favorite alley in Akron, but I love it so much here. Like there's, so much life here and there's so much these buildings have such a rich history and are so fascinating um, so we're here this actually used to be an HVAC company I forget the name of the actual building it's up on the front there if you look up um, this used to be an HVAC building so I love that it's this old industrial building turned into this but all of these buildings are connected Chill Ice Cream's next door which you know, one of my favorite restaurants in Akron, as I refer to it. <laughs> um, and then up the stairs is Akron Coffee Roasters, the nightlight, who we're partnering with to do some events later this year that I can't talk about yet, but they're gonna be amazing. Um, and then we have Uncorked Wine Bar with the gallery, and then High Street Hop House. And then, you know, Craves over there, and then you come down, but Blue Plate and Blue Jazz. Blue Jazz is if you haven't been there, you need to go. It's my, it's my favorite place to go. Like aside from here, like I just go sit down there and no matter what night it's on, the music is amazing and it's dark and cozy and I just go down there for some quiet time and kind of to get away from all of the wildness of down here. Um, but what's exciting is the hotel across the street. So across from Blue Plate is Blue Teak Hotel that's gonna be opening, I think in September if I'm correct. And that place is bonkers. I can't wait to see it finished. Like I've been able to watch from the beginning of it and it's been so, I'm just so excited for it. So something that really has been lacking down here for Musica is we need food at night, you know? So Blue Plate and Crave are amazing, but sometimes if you're at a show, you just want some carry out, like just something to take over there. So what's gonna happen is that little space that was has been Urban Eats for years. Urban Eats was open during the day from eight to three for lunch. They were amazing, the food was fantastic. Um, they got a really amazing opportunity for something else. So what the changes that are coming is that we're making that the new entrance to Musica. So instead of coming through the alley door, you're gonna be going into what was formerly Urban Eats in September 1st will become Nam's Squared, Nam's second location. And they will be serving food at night, Tuesday through Saturday. You can get the food and you can come sit in Musica, you can go up to Hop House, you can go sit on the uncorked patio, 
You can get the food and travel with it, and there's food down here in the evenings. Then beside that, um, there's a little retail space that's been there for years, and we've had many, many amazing businesses in there, but that's my space now. So um, my other thing I do is uh, vintage clothing and secondhand fashion. So I sell designer and vintage clothing, and I'm also a fashion photographer and photographer. Um, so that is my new shop. There's so much talent, like in the early 2000s, Akron had kind of this, in the 70s there was the, you know, Devo, Chrissy Hines, you know, Tin Huey, like all these amazing things, and it happened in the early 2000s with a couple of bands, one very famous one now, um, but I feel like right now there's this group of musicians around here that are phenomenal. I mean, there's just, I haven't seen anything like it since the early 2000s, and that's what I'm hoping to support. I'm very particular. We have an amazing, amazing crew of sound engineers, and our head of sound, Alex, is the best. Um, but we really have the equipment and have the room to tailor to fans individual needs. You know, and it's, um, you know, sometimes it's really fun when I'm in here working, I blast classical music through the speakers. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> I feel really fortunate to have this this space with the sound, like literally anything sounds good through here. Um, and it's what separates us from other venues and where there are other shows is our, our quality of equipment, our quality of sound. Like we, it's a big investment and I take ownership of it. Like I'm very protective of it. Um, our people know what they're doing and they're experienced with all sorts of musicians and that's what I love. I know what this place is capable of and I know with this block, I just see it all coming to life. And it's not that it hasn't been to life before, but it needs to be consistently thriving and just lit up. I just want to see it lit up. So I wanted the space to be used and accessible and a welcoming place at least five nights a week. And that's what we're doing. So if you know there's not a band playing, you know that there's either a DJ or good music and we're just sort of hanging out and you're welcome here. Next up, we're here at the historic Glendale Steps. Now this place has a very rich history and it is an amazing work of art. Let's go see what this place is all about. Uh, yeah, well, it's always different just depending on the weather. Um, it can be a little bit difficult to get up. You can see right now because of all the rain we've had, uh, some of the dirt is washed onto the steps. So you often have sometimes different debris, but there's been groups in the last 30 years that have been coming through here. Uh, I think the West Hill organization, uh, youth groups that have been great about cleaning up a lot of the debris that falls down on the steps to make it look better. Uh, obviously during the snowy season it could be a little difficult to get up. And that was always the problem with the Glendale steps. Even in the 1930s when they were first built, a lot of the people said uh, they thought they were too steep and they weren't sure how many people would actually use these steps. So they are, they are fun to go up. They're not that difficult to get up, but uh, for the average person walking up and down the steps, they didn't think it was maybe the most useful steps uh, around. You can see how steep it is. Uh, uh, here. Oh uh, yeah, that's one of the reasons they built the steps in the first place is it's close to downtown. So you can see that there's not much traffic going through. You can't really hear a lot from the inner belt, which is nearby about a quarter of a mile. But uh, that's one of the reasons they wanted to use this as a shortcut for this neighborhood to get down to street level, to get over to downtown. But really uh, a lot of this history goes to Glendale Park. Uh, they wanted to develop a park down here for adults and children uh, to have fun outside of downtown, not only for this neighborhood, but anybody that wanted to come hang out downtown. So that was kind of the dream of this, to make these steps where you could get, the neighborhood could get down here, uh, was probably the purpose of the steps. But there was also this park that they wanted to develop for use for everyone. Uh, they, they ran into problems from the start when they first uh, tried to purchase this area because uh, Lewis Miller's family, the uh, uh, famous uh, businessman, educator, uh, philanthropist, whose uh, daughter Mar married Thomas Edison, he owned this area. Uh, and after his death, the city of Akron kind of paid a steep price to purchase part of his land. His house is actually still standing above the hill there. 
Um, it's on the National Register of Historic Places. So they uh, bought the land by 1910. They were, they were in negotiations for it, and they thought they paid too much, but they reluctantly bought the land from the Lewis Miller uh, uh, des descendants. And it had problems from the get-go. The Akron Garden Club really wanted to make the park really nice. Uh, and the Akron Garden Club was headed up by Paul Litchfield's wife, uh, Cyberling's wife. So some of the wealthy elite were the head of the Akron Garden Club that really were in charge of developing in this area, area for about 30 years or, or more. Uh, but what happened is they never got funding, and that was that was true in the 1910s, the 20s, 30s, and even in the 1960s when people of Akron wanted them to do something with Glendale Park, uh, the city never invested the money. Even a lot of the park commissioners wanted uh, Glendale Park turned into something that uh, people could enjoy outside of downtown, and uh, they never could find the money to do so. Uh, so kind of maybe a little bit of the death sentence of Glendale Park was they sold part of Glendale Park to put the Interbout through there in the late 60s, early 70s. And so some of the land that Interbout is on is what Glendale Park is. Because you can see if you uh, around here, when you're down here, there's not actually much of a park left. Uh, it's really just a road, a parking lot. The Glendale Steps is the most park-like thing you see. Yeah, so it's a WPA, Works Progress Administration. Um, was in charge of this. Uh, as you can, on the historical marker over there, it's uh, cost about $22,000. Um, it took, uh, it started in July of 1936, and it took until uh, the end of 1937. They ran into some delays for various reasons. Uh, the WPA workers could only work so many hours a week, only could make so much money. There were, uh, cutting stone isn't uh, the easiest thing to do, and there were only so many stone cutters. And the stone cutters actually, uh, a lot of them didn't need WPA work, so they didn't have a lot of stone cutters available. So that delayed the work. And even in the summer of 1937, uh, after June, they were out of money July, August, and into September, and they had to wait for more money to be approved in October to finish the job. So it uh, was an interesting project in that way. Again, there were 6,000 workers in Summit County that were in, pro in charge of this project. They worked on the, this Miller Reservoir, Waterworks Park. Uh, they did a lot of work for Summit Metro Parks, just to name a few. So that's kind of how uh, they started doing this project. Again, uh, you can see, see it's kind of in a zigzag pattern because they, uh, they originally wanted to go straight down, but they realized it was too steep. So they decided the steps had the zigzag to make it less steep. And they have a kind of a platform up there in the middle where you could stop and rest. And you could also overlook this valley where they, they expected it to be kind of scenic. But again, it was tough from the beginning because as they were finishing up, a lot of the residents started to use these steps and the problem that they had, uh, the residents reported back to the WPA that they thought the steps were still too, too steep, and they also questioned uh, how many people were actually going to use it. So that was kind of the problem with the uh, Glendale steps from the beginning. Uh, it's a uh, cool historic area. The architecture is great, but again, it wasn't. A, it's kind of location, location, location. It wasn't really a spot where people expected it to be used widely. It was probably the biggest problem, uh, and then the second, the secondary problem was there were people that thought these these stones were still a little, a little bit too steep. And amazingly enough, the city of Akron is still talking about making downtown, improving downtown and trying to put something like a park on the, the inner belt area. So it's still kind of a dream that if the city of Akron is able to do that, uh, I think that this area could be more successful. And you probably do want to connect downtown to this historic Glendale area, not just the, the steps, uh, but the cemetery. I'm here at Portage Lakes. As you can see behind me, it is water skiing season. So to wrap this show up, I'm going to head over to Emerald Lake over in Norton to check out the Chippewa Lake Water Ski Show Team. Let's go see what they're all about. I love this sport. This is one of the few sports where everyone in your family can participate and compete at a very high level and all have a meaningful role in helping to achieve the goals and objectives of the team. So it's a very special thing. Um, we, you have lots of families that are members that are competing at Division I Nationals and we're the only Division I team in the state of Ohio. And uh, the, the younger uh, kids are just as important to the show and the production as are the older adults.
So the team uh, began in Chippewa Lake, Ohio. Uh, it was restarted back in 1997 by Scott Walkley and Tom Melter. That's uh, Southern Medina County, where the old amusement park used to be. For those of you who don't know uh, Ohio too well, or maybe Medina County too well. And so we skied out there for uh, quite a few years, up until about 2003 or four. There were some, uh, some major flooding issues, and uh, we kind of moved the shows to here in Emerald Lake, Norton, Ohio, where we put on our uh, Wednesday night performances and where we hold our competition practices. What, what, what is important to understand is that for, for show skiing, there are a number of things that are performed on the water. It's not just one event. So in other words, we have slalom skiers on the water. We have barefooters on the water. We have jumpers. We have adagio doubles, which are paired couples that are out on the water. Um, so there, we have a, a wakeboard, a, a wakeboard riders who are doing inverts. Um, so everything that pretty much is done on the water, that shows up somewhere in a show ski production. And so the way, the way you practice that is you all winter long, we're working on those acts. In other words, we'll be in a gymnasium all winter long working on the pyramids that you'll see today. So we, we stand in a gymnasium, we tie ropes off to a basketball goal, and the girls practice standing up, traversing to the middle, and then climbing to their spots within a pyramid and then coming back down successfully. We would never take a pyramid to the water until we could do that on land successfully. So that's just one example of one of the, one of the acts that's in a show is a pyramid, which is the most photographed act in show skiing, pyramids. Um, other acts, uh, we actually work really hard throughout the winter to put the production together. So we're working on scripts for the stage and actors and actresses and what they're going to say and when and how that ties into the skiing that's going on on the water. So it's all, and also we spend a lot of time with the announcer because the announcer is directing the attention of the crowd. So if there's something that we're getting ready to do and we don't want the crowd to watch that while we're getting ready, the announcer is trained to direct the crowd's attention somewhere else in the, in the area. And, and so, it's a, it's, so it's a very complex production that has a lot of moving parts and it takes all winter long to really work through that, to not only master the skills that, that are needed to do the skiing on water, but also the actual production of, of, of the theatrical performance as well. It's a pretty niche sport. I mean, uh, we're one of two teams in Ohio and there's not a whole lot of teams in the other Midwest states, but I, I think what's really cool is that it's truly a, a whole family sport, uh, ranging from the little kids all the way up to if you're an older adult. I mean, you're gonna see in some of our pyramids out there, we have kids about the age of six, seven years old climbing to the tippy top and on the base, there's their dad standing down there with, with them on their shoulders. And so it, it's a sport that really focuses on family and just kind of being together and working out there on the water to the best of your ability. So if you get a shot, come on out. I mean, it's just a fantastic time. So to get involved in show skiing, it's so simple. All you have to do is show up. That's it. We have all the equipment. We have the expertise. In fact, uh, we just finished a few weeks ago our, learn, our free Learn to Ski program to the community, which we did at Chippewa Lake, where people just signed up online at our website. Um, and, they, and they showed up. And we, uh, we taught about 50 kids that day to ski. Um, so it's just a matter of just making the time and coming out. We have the equipment, we have the expertise, we have the boats, and we are committed. Part of our mission is not only to compete, but more importantly, it's, it's to develop, it's to expose the sport of water skiing to everyone, give, make, give everyone access to the sport of water skiing because, because it's such a great sport and it's so much fun and it's, it's from a health perspective, it, it's really a great way to stay in shape. And, um, and so we are, we are advocates and, uh, for the sport and we're promoting it to the community. We want to make it very easy and we do. This, uh, if you're a show skier and you're passionate about it, this is your life. And I often tell people, this is, this is my other life. 
So I have my professional life and then I have my show ski life. And quite frankly, um, the folks that, that are part of this team, this is a family. We've, we, we raise each other's kids, we travel together, we've not, uh, we have kids that started on this team when they were two feet tall, they're now adults and married, and we have grandchildren, and so it's a, it's a very close-knit family, which makes it so special. Thank you once again for tuning into a route Akram with Blue Green. Now, if you have any questions, comments, or you just want to drop me an email, you can reach me at www.aroundakronwithbluegreen.com or you can catch me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you so much and have an amazing day. Next up, we're here in downtown Akron at Miss. Next up, we're here in. We're going to talk about music here. We're going to talk about ski, blah, blah, blah. But we're going to talk about music, huh? Yeah. No, on this episode, we're going to talk about urban. Yeah. ABC123 here with Blue Green, you and me. Okay. Next up, we're here. Ah. This is a heck of a workout to go up and down these, but it also has a very rich history. Eh. Eyes. See some really cool views. Yeah. <laughs> it's also a good time to hit puberty. <clears throat> <clears throat> <laughs> At the Chippewa Lake, we're gonna. I hate motorcycles when I'm filming.